Uh, we're very excited to have uh, Scott McLeod with us tonight uh, in conversation with Nicole Broder uh, to talk about, among other things, uh, his new graphic novel, The Sculptor. Uh, just a few brief announcements before we get started. Uh, books are on display uh, just behind you, uh, to your left, if you haven't seen them already. Uh, book signing will happen after the presentation uh, at the table just down this hallway here. You probably saw it on your way in, but it's just going to be down there. The line will form it If you would like a signed no, copy, we ask that you please uh, purchase it before having it signed. Uh, also, the store technically closes at 8 p.m. Uh oh. Uh, but if we do run long, uh, no one will be kicked out or locked in. Uh, after <laughs> store closing, uh, we'll keep a register open, and you can exit uh, out the east doors. That's the ones out to this parking lot here. Uh, you just have to turn the handle on the door. Uh, lastly, if you did park in our lot and would like your parking validated, uh, just ask me or any other bookstore employee. We'd be happy to do that for you. Uh, a lot of other great events happening in the next few weeks. Uh, we're hosting David Axelrod at Town Hall next week. Uh, that's on Friday at 7.30. Uh, he'll be in conversation with Steve Scher, and there are still some tickets available, uh, those from Brown Paper Tickets. Uh, so for a complete list of events, pick up a paper schedule. Uh, we'll have some by tonight's books, uh, or visit ubookstore.com. Now, on to tonight's guest. Scott McCloud is the award-winning author of Understanding Comics, Making Comics, Zot, and many other fiction and non-fiction comics spanning 30 years. An internationally recognized authority on comics and visual communication, technology, and the power of storytelling, McCloud has lectured at Google, Pixar, Sony, and the Smithsonian Institution. His most uh, recent work, The Sculptor, was published just last week by First Second Books. Joining Scott in conversation tonight is Seattle Times columnist Nicole Broder. So with that, please join me in welcoming them both, Scott McCloud and Nicole Broder. Thank you. I'm, whoa, I'm double mic'd. Yeah. Yeah. So we're not going to miss a word. No. Um, you, were th you spoke at the Smithsonian. It was a long time ago. I and need to take that out of my bio. Take it out? Yeah. <laughs> did you go see anything cool there, like Mr. Rogers' sweater or anything like we that? We did, during the tour, we did, the, the, like, the mall in a day. I mean, there's a lot of museums there, right? Yeah. We, we were just, like, racing through them. It was like a 24-hour <laughs> like comic. an enjoyable vacation. It was cool. You can't really race through the Holocaust <laughs> Museum, though. It's, <laughs> it's kind of un uncool. It's terrible. <laughs> terrible. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I asked Scott if calling anyone a comic nerd would be an insult and he said no we embrace it it's good yeah. it's fine so mostly I'm right am i any dissent there what do you think are we okay no nerds are okay yeah nerds are good yes i'm not a comic nerd i think i vaguely remember a copy of fritz the cat in my brother's room at some point <laughs> in the 70s but beyond that i'm uh, i'm uh, I, I but that said i love the book i Thank read you. it i loved it it's wonderful does everyone have a copy? Are they buying one tonight? You really should. Have you already gone through it? <laughs> Way to put finished? people on the spot. <laughs> no, buy the goddamn book. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. kidding. Um, okay, so let's get started. Congratulations on the book. Thank you. Um, it's your first graphic novel in 30 years. My first big one. Uh, you know, like, I thought the introduction was very diplomatic in the way it, it skated over uh, McLeod's flyover country books, like <laughs> like Reinventing Comics, My Troubled Middle Child, and the, <laughs> and the much despised New Adventures of Abraham Lincoln that nobody liked. Really? Except for you my did kids. New Adventures of Abraham it's Lincoln? Not, it's not well liked, but yeah. it's are small. Are there copies? Can someone <laughs> so grab me one? But this is why we call it my first full-length graphic novel, Got because it. then we can... I would say it's 500 pages, yeah. um, and it took five years, yeah. two years of layouts, and four revisions. Yeah, of, uh, of the layouts, yeah, and then three years on the finished art, yeah. Three years, wow. Yeah. Well, it's, somebody called it your magnum opus. Chicagoist calls it your magnum opus. I call it walking the walk, and what <laughs> I tell you. Thanks, I like that better, I, actually. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, since you wrote your two other books, you, there were some pretty large expectations. Okay, this guy's been teaching us how to do it all these years. Yeah. Let's see what, what he can do. So it was good to see everything that you, most of what you read, wrote about in your other books were there. I mean, yeah. There was, a lot of, there was a lot of pressure, but it was, it was the good kind. Right. You know, whereas I, I, I've said that I like had to do a good job because for the same reason people sit down on roller coasters. 
It's just like there was just no alternative. No. If I if I if I screwed up, it was just going to be so conspicuous. And all over the internet too. Yeah, no, it'd be all over. Everybody <laughs> would have been like, "Oh my God, do you remember when he came out with that yeah, thing?" This guy and, thinks he knows. You know, like everybody would be burning their copy. <laughs> like there's there's a special like humiliation has has a sort of mechanics to it and humiliation is oh so much more delicious when you call attention to yourself ahead of time mm -hmm. like my, my brother my brother had this um, this friend come into a really crowded party this is many many years ago and he just shouted to the whole assembled room he just said hey everybody look it's an unbreakable coke bottle and then he smashed it on the floor and it broke into a million pieces and that and like for me the key of that story was the hey everybody look yeah right you know so uh, so understanding comics is my hey everybody look before i like swan dive yeah exactly yeah. but i loved i mean i think if everybody's i'm i'm assuming you've taken the sleeve off but this is awesome just it's, it's i think it looks beautiful. better without the sleeve i do too i and it's just kind of cool to walk around with it people are like hey who is that so it's it's just a really and I meant to ask, is this for a second that's their logo right Yeah, now? it's okay. actually kind of a cool logo when you think about it. Yeah, because it means like the whole book is is going to, you know, keep the man is living on a on a on a calendar. So yeah, the ultimate calendar, deadline, yeah. The ultimate deadline. Okay. So, let's talk about that pressure that you can you talk about that a little bit more because I'm sure you put a lot of it on yourself and then oh, yeah. let's just talk about the book. Um, so are you done talking about all the pressure you were under? Because you were under a lot of pressure. I was under a lot of pressure. No, it's, it's um, yeah, it was good. It just, I don't know, it just kind of worked in the end. Uh, everything converged in the right way. I had enough time because I had a really sweet editor who, uh, who wanted me to, to work really hard and, and, and no matter how long it took. This was supposed to be a three-year project. I was just given two extra years. It's like, go, it's okay. You know, like, let's throw away the schedule. You want to get this right, let's get this right. You know, that's a gift. I mean, think of all the things that have to come into place for that to happen. Not everybody gets to do that. Very few people get to do that, right? You got to pay the bills. We had just enough money in the bank that we didn't go broke. My kids you didn't go hungry. Kids in college. I have two kids in college, right? Yeah. So we were able to pull it out without me, you know, without us going completely into bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. Not everybody can do that. Not everybody can work on anything for five years. But we were lucky. We had a good deal. I had an agent who got me enough dough to sit on my ass for five years. And I had an editor who was okay with, with two years worth of overruns just because he knew what it was I wanted to do and was willing to, you know, like make it happen. And everybody supported it. And it's like, I am so lucky. This wasn't, this didn't have to go this way. Mm -hmm. Everybody could have been panicking and running around and worrying, oh my God, what did we get into? This freak wants to take all this time. But no, it just worked. It was and right. this is all that you did. I mean, you didn't start this earlier because you did, you know, you did making comics and then you had the Chrome comic and you had other yeah. things going on. But um, this started in earnest this was your only project yeah for five years apart from traveling um i worked 11 hours a day seven days a week for five years except for the last year when it was more like 13 hours a day um now i did i did stop you know like i would i would do trips you know sometimes i would do lectures or workshops sometimes just a small piece of each month and and i would say oh i should be working you know like i'm doing this lecture i should be working and, and i'd be my wife would be like scott you know that's working too right yeah, yeah. you do know that's also working so i yeah i just did nothing but work well good i mean it shows it thanks really shows. It's just a great <laughs> so tell us about david smith um he's a struggling artist who is a fretful guy for a young guy yeah. he's, he's a pretty He's a fretful, troubled man. He worries a lot. You know, he like, does worry. You know, if this was, I, I think maybe because it's comics, we don't necessarily know, but I could almost imagine that if you met him in real life that you would realize, oh, he has this problem. You know, like he's, like some, maybe somewhere on the spectrum or yeah. something. Not that that's necessarily a problem, but, but I'm just saying like that, that there's something, like probably there's something a little non- neurotypical about him like that he's he's really obsessed with certain Spends things a lot of times with his head in his hands yeah he's very compulsive he has these promises to himself it's really compulsive behavior mm -hmm. so yeah he's he's kind of a mess okay How, um so but he's there's a lot of you in him i 
mean. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Time to connect He's A to B. <laughs> Struggling artist, that's yeah. what I meant. But yeah. uh, and he's afraid of being forgotten, as I said. Yeah. Uh, thinking about mortality all the time. Yeah. Um, and his greatest obstacle is himself. Yeah, very much so. Is that you? Yeah. Well, it can be. Yeah. I think that. I mean, I dodged a bullet in not becoming more like him because I was sort of on my on the road to becoming more like him. My my wife kind of saved me a lot. Like his the the, the woman in the story, Meg, saves David. Um, my natural tendency was to be to just spiral down just to being more and more isolated and more and more obsessed and you know eventually becoming you know a middle-aged guy writing angry letters to the government or whatever mm -hmm. but um, uh, this <laughs> so why don't we talk about the um, just the basic um, oh yeah the plot the book, yeah the plot of the book. yeah the basic plot is that just this, this young artist is contemplating his life as a loser at 26 he had a little he had a little success and then it all came crashing down when he pissed off his patron and uh, then a, a, dis a deceased relative, although he's too drunk to realize it at first, uh, comes and offers him a deal. It's basically death has come to offer him a deal uh, where he can, he can, he's a sculptor and he can shape um, anything he wants with his bare hands, uh, but he only has 200 days to live. And so he gets, he gets what he wants. He, he takes the deal right away. But the, the problem is that when he has that ability, when all of his obstacles, all of his physical obstacles, and financial obstacles, when they all fall away and he can make exactly what he sees, then the problems start because now, now his biggest obstacle, as you say, is him, himself. The limits of his imagination or the lack of understanding of what it is that he wants to say with his art in the first place. Um, that's when, that the, when things go really wrong in a lot of ways. And all the while this clock is ticking. And all the while the clock is as ticking. As soon as the clock starts, he gets everything that he wants, basically, Yeah. for the most part. Yeah, be careful what you wish for is it's sort of the mechanics message. of the story, yeah. Okay. Um, it's very thoughtful. Um, he's, he is very thoughtful, almost too much, um, obviously. Um, also like it's, me. It's beautiful work. <laughs> I don't know you that well, so. <laughs> Is there so in case you, you were share, curious, share yeah, I may be a little too thoughtful about something. Okay. Actually, my friend, I should say, my friend Kurt Busick um, uh, told me at one point, he says, Scott, you care too much about everything. And I really irritated him when I took it as a compliment. Because <laughs> he was trying, he was trying, trying to, to snap you he out was of trying it. to help me. Yeah. And I wasn't taking. Yeah. Okay. Um, but it's beautiful work, and Thank it's you. visuals that move through time, and it's, I don't know what the term is for it not being fully all color, it's... it's Duotone, Duotone maybe, yeah. or it's two color, it's, yeah. It's Black colors. and a Pantone spot, two five, or six five three. Pantone six five three, in case you're wondering. <laughs> And, and there are people in the, I don't know that, but there are people in the room who are nodding along. Like, ah, <laughs> right, maybe yes. you noticed. Maybe oh, look. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about how some of the scene. I was very, very struck by the by, by the art. I mean, I thought just thought it was gorgeous. Thank you so much. So you have, uh, and I love how clean it is. It's just mm. so crisp and clean. So um, there are these visuals that move through time, um, and that includes the time it takes to turn the page, and then yeah. the layout is right. Everything was painstakingly put together, obviously, um, to read. You know, like a like a um, I can read like a book, like, like a novel, novel. yeah, like a novel. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and it also shows a lot of emotions. So, I wanted to ask if we could maybe pull up a couple of sure, the, absolutely the pages. Um, I really now here's a couple things, um, Scott. You used you took photos all over the streets of New York, mm -hmm. and you used Google Street Map in order to place the characters and show where they lived yeah. and where, they're, where they went to restaurants and bars and all kinds of things, how long it took them to walk, where they were when they were walking. That's right, places. yeah. Oh, it was, it was a real that's gift. pretty amazing. Yeah, I have my character walks at 3 in the morning from uh, Chelsea to, uh, excuse me, from Williamsburg to Chelsea, and I got to like find what that looks like without having to walk at it at 3 in the morning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so can great. we just see a couple of those? Sure. Yeah, because give me a page I really number. I loved um, some of those panels. Oh, oh, just that scene. 
of the New York street scene? Yeah, sure, I can bring Is that, that up. Is that the one with all the, all the dialogue in it? Yeah. Okay. Well, um, the, uh, the walking, the walking back home, that's, here we go. Um, so yeah, all these backgrounds were, um, were actual places, you know, <laughs> that I got to check out um, on the way back. That dude up in the corner with the teeth? Yeah, with he the tea, yeah. yeah, real in-your-face face, face <laughs> as my editor put it. And, you know, here's an example. This is the Williamsburg Bridge. And when I was first doing it, you know, like a tourist dumbbell, you know, I said, how about the Brooklyn Bridge? That's a good bridge. That's a New York Bridge, the Brooklyn Bridge. And it's like, no, actually, if you want to map it, you know, he would, he would go over the Williamsburg Bridge. And so it's like, okay, well, let's make the Williamsburg, Williamsburg Bridge work. And this is a, something that I discovered that there were ways to avoid the tourist trap, mm -hmm. right? Of, of like, oh, look, it takes place in New York. Here are all the typical Here's touristy the things. State Here's the Empire State, State, State Building. I don't even know if you see the Empire State Building. Um, but uh, like one of the key scenes, for instance, when he's in Times Square, I did Times Square without really showing you the big video screens at all because he's got a hoodie on and it's, it's a wet day and he's looking at his feet and he's hungry and he's not paying attention, but you hear the voices. So I get to do a portrait of Times Square just in voices. Do you have that? Yeah, sure. That's, that's one of my favorite ones yeah, too. Yeah. The one that I, I there are two, two scenes that um, he's in a bar at one point and then he's in Times Square. And they're just bu bubbles all around. Of, um, and, and it's just great. It's exactly what people say. It's exactly how Yeah, this is a, down here. It's exactly at, what you would hear. You're going to see. Um, oh, wait. We're, oh, is right, it, I can't do that. Is bubbles the right term? Am I just a total nerd? No, uh, actually, you know what? My generation called them word balloons, and I don't know, older people in the audience may be surprised to learn that that's just not done anymore. What do you call them? What do people call they them? They call them speech bubbles. Ew. I, <laughs> isn't that crazy? Disgusting. I don't know, anyway. this is, isn't advancing properly, but uh, there we go. Yeah, this is... Stri in the corner there. Weirdly enough, I, I feel weird even saying this, but if you check the latest issue of Entertainment Weekly, you'll see an in-depth <laughs> examination of my lettering techniques, including this panel. <laughs> it's like a, there's a two-page spread in the Entertainment Weekly that has The Walking Dead on the cover, and it's all about this stuff. But yeah, you have, uh, it's a little hard to read here, but you know, you have people talking about Troy and Abed in the morning, except it's in French. You know, you have people talking about like, get your, you know, I should have gone to TKTS. Somebody is saying, uh, um, uh, Timmy, don't look at the cowboy. You know, it's, <laughs> so, so it's just like all this stuff that says it's Times Square. And I have things like where the, the word balloons are going off the panel border. So it's just the sense of an ambient surrounding. It's just, mm -hmm. it's just surrounding you. And, uh, and, but this, but you know, this is all you get of the of the big video screens because you don't need the big and video that's screens. All you need. That's yeah. all you need. it was enough. I just thought it was great. Um, Thanks. So I, I want to talk about him a little more and how much of him is you? And <laughs> Forty percent. Okay, I'll take that number. Um, struggling artist. I mean, I heard someone ask you earlier, does do you have to be do you have to struggle to be an artist? And no. I mean, at some point, yeah, but this guy just can't get a break yeah. until the uh, well, I'll shut up. Well he struggles <laughs> he struggles with, you know, against his own demons, really, mm -hmm. as much as anything else. He focuses on the external obstacles. Mm -hmm. But really it's 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 just the nature of the universe. He can't he can't get past the idea that it's all subjective for starters. You know, he's always looking over his shoulder. He's always looking for validation. Mm -hmm. And there is no validation because in art, you know, as, as, one, as his friend Oliver says in the story, there is no art meter on Jupiter, you know, <laughs> that's, that's measuring your progress. It's just not going to happen. You're, you're, you're stuck. You know, it's just, it, it'll always be just what people say about you. Mm -hmm. And that's all you can do is just please yourself, right? But, but he can't do it because for him, it's exactly what you said. He's terrified of being forgotten, mm -hmm. which is slightly different than desiring to be remembered, right? Those are two slightly different things. For him, it's like the, the whole world is like the, the deck of the Titanic just tilting and mm -hmm. trying to send him off into yeah. oblivion. And he's trying to lay down art in this world like anchors, something permanent, something mm -hmm. he can hold on to and stay in this world longer and not just slide off into oblivion like his 
like his family members, these people who have gone for, for perfectly ordinary reasons, one after another. He had, he had two parents and a sister, and they've all gone already, already, not only dead, but forgotten. And they were creative people just like him, mm -hmm. but they have well, been forgotten in their him. lives. Not, I mean, not by him, yes. And then, well, in fact, that, that is one of the things that sort of comes around in right. the story. I mean, I, I was struck by his youth. I mean, when you get older, you know, I don't know if, if you think about that as much, but he was obsessed with being remembered and being not forgotten. Yeah, it's that accelerated and aging, not only because the only... of the 200 days, but also the fact that at the age of 26, he's given the opportunity to see how his life will be if he takes the, the path right. most taken, if he, if, he, if, if he just lets the art go and just has an ordinary life. And mm -hmm. he's challenged to say, you know, like, what's wrong with that? To, to have, you know, kids and family, and, you know, maybe you make art in the basement for a little while and it goes, but, you know, like, but hey, you have, you have love, you have a roof over your head, you have food to eat. Mm -hmm. Isn't that enough? Mm -hmm. You know, billions of people would kill for that life. You know, but no, it's not enough. It's not enough for him, and he has to go for it. Go for this supernatural Faustian deal that he's offered. So let's go to you know just a little more about where it came from and and when it started to come together in your mind. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that you said much of it, forty percent, is based on you. <laughs> and then um, the woman and his his girlfriend in the book is based on your wife and your relationship yes. with your wife. Correct? Seventy percent. Seventy percent. <laughs> Is that, um, is that creepily specific? Yeah. <laughs> so how did the story come together, and why this sort of story? Um, I mean, were there any other things that you were, you know, is this the kind of book that you always wanted to do, or did you dabble in other things that didn't work out, or how did this kind of thing come I, together? I had many different projects I wanted to do. They were just sort of sitting out there, fiction projects, mm -hmm. while I worked on the nonfiction stuff, and while I worked on my webcomics experiments in the odds. And we're talking decades now. Mm -hmm where I was away from fiction. And um, this particular idea, the, the initial idea of that sort of super-powered sculptor, which sounds incredibly childish and dumb. You could have just put a costume on. Yeah, right, exactly. Super sculptor. <laughs> um, but that, that goes way back to my when I was very young. I think either high school or college, I'm not sure. But it was just this idea written down in this old three-ring binder with a denim cover with the, the blue ballpoint on it it's just like it's like guy. right yeah exactly yeah the guy, guy sitting on the bus uh, here's an idea <laughs> how about it's like he's like wolverine except his bones are made of concrete or whatever <laughs> uh, right but it was that phase of my life right yeah but then then you know the romance comes in with this woman i'm secretly in love with for seven years I wound up marrying later you just said no game right is no that your problem hmm? you had no game i had no game i had seven no years? game seven, seven years. years no it was just she was otherwise engaged I, <laughs> um, and i was a gentleman um <laughs> it just is what it so is you just sat on the bus with your i just notebook sat on the bus with my notebook yes <laughs> <laughs> playing with my notebook and then um uh yeah, this is only working half the time. And then, uh, uh, you know, I had the deal with death. I had the, okay, so I had this basic sketch of an outline of an idea. And it was kind of hokey, and it was kind of had one foot in the superhero world. But then I just kept thinking about it as I do. I think about these ideas. They were in the back of my head. And it started to grow a little bit and grow a little bit. This is over decades, literally decades. And it kept tugging at me, and I would talk to my wife about it. And I would say, yeah, the sculptor. I, I, am I, should I be doing the sculptor? And, and I kept away from it for a long time because I kept telling, I kept, kept going on the stump saying, comics are about more than just superheroes. And way in the back, I had this sweaty idea, you know, lurking in the closet of this, what's a serious superhero story? There's nothing more uncool than a serious superhero story. Mm -hmm. You know, I, had, I compared it to like if Phil Collins got Genesis back together to do a rock opera about the life of Leonardo da Vinci, you know, <laughs> just this awful middle brow horror show. But, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized, no, this is actually a really good story. You just have to say Phil Collins. I'm like, no, please, for the love of God. I loved Trick of the Tale when I was 18 years old. Oh I'm God. so sorry. Okay. Phil Collins era Genesis. 
Yeah. But yeah, I was a prog rock kid and I was like, I was scared and ashamed of the part of me that was still a prog rock kid. And I was thinking, is this prog rock? Should I not do this? But I... <laughs> but 500 the pages more, of prog rock. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. That's like, talk about a belly flop as a writer. It's like, Mr. Understanding Comics. Yes. You know, like, here we go. But. But I realized, no, you know what? God is in the details. Of this. Small g, God. I'm an atheist, but you know what I mean. Uh -huh. It was in the details. I mean, It's a Wonderful Life is an awful piece of cheese until you start to fill it out. It's right. still, it's, and you fill it out with that gorgeous, wonderful thing that they made. Right. And, and I realized, yeah, if I fill this out properly, this could be wonderful. And, and so I, I, I went for it, and it took five years. Okay. Um, when you were a kid, I, I, I wanted to talk about it a little more. Were certain panels particularly vexing? And, and let's talk briefly about your process, and then I want to talk about your childhood and growing up and that kind of thing. Certain panels? Yeah. Um, were, there, were there areas of it that were just, um, you know, some of them looked pretty, they, some were beautifully simple and clean, and others looked like they were probably, um, the concept was... Yeah, some, uh, sometimes you'd have those panels that were your, like your favorite panels and they mm -hmm. took 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then there would be other panels that like you okay. still hate to this day and, mm -hmm. they, and they take days. I wanted to um, just point out the one with the time on the sidewalk. Sure, yeah, absolutely, about. yeah. Um, I just think he had such a great way of showing time passing. And again, the guy has 200 days to live. So the whole book is um, um, under a, you know, it's got an egg timer right in front of it. He's under the calendar. And you slip in these great reminders of, um, of uh, you know, you'll just say. Do you have a page number? Uh, Sorry. It's, it's like <laughs> I should have my copy. 152? Let's think, try. Wait, wait, it might should. be. Let's find out. Oh, preview. Is preview not working? Oh, I was on 152. Ha huh. ha. OK. Sorry. No, it would be much later. Yeah, it is much better. And then you're all going to go, yeah, okay. You know what? I'll go back to descriptions here. Here we go. I don't know why I'm not advancing. I'm sorry. Oh, God. This is like 1996 okay, demo right. hell. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's 330. All right. Here we go. Yeah, there. That one with also is on the back cover as well. Isn't that cool? Yeah, that's just a See, visualization. No, yeah. not, no, nothing. No, no, I I nobody would say that. I would. I would say that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, those were wonderful. Yeah, and that's and that's one of those symbolic flourishes that you can do in comics. You you can just imagine if this was a movie and you like did that, <laughs> people in the audience would go, oh. Yeah, but that's look you away. Can, you can in comics. You can yeah. do something so cool like that. And again, you know, it shows. It just shows so much. It shows his, you know, dread and, and moroseness and yeah. time and where you are in the story. And it, it's yeah, just a so. great thing. Yeah. It was just the concepts I thought were really wonderful. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about your childhood. Um, I was um, struck by the fact that your dad was an engineer and he was blind. Yeah. And you have a brother and a sister, correct? Uh, I have two. Once, I have two brothers and a sister. Yeah. And they're very sciencey people as well. Uh, and you're kind, kind of, of the yeah. Creative guy, I'm way over here on the kind of the outlier. right, yeah, <laughs> the outlier, I guess. Yeah, I so, was. Although, except I really wasn't, because I was very much an engineer's kid, and and I had that kind of analytical uh, thing. I also had, I think, some of the same like OCD tics and borderline ADHD or whatever it was. It's never or, borderline. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, it is or it I isn't. gotta say, my, you know, my dad died when I was like 22, and so I have a kind of idealized memories of him. But my older brother was 10 years older, so he knew him for a bigger chunk of his life, and he was explaining to me how how dad really has. He was kind of Asperger's a little. My brother is very very Asperger's. I know that doesn't exist anymore. That that's the DSM eliminated it. But you know they were. They, you know, had certain things that you now recognize as, oh, right, sure, I recognize that. Mm -hmm. So it, go, it runs through the family. I clearly have a bit of it myself. And, um, but he, said, he was telling me about this, and I suddenly realized that there was an old family story about my dad and how he, they decided to have me the youngest because dad didn't like the fact that the, um, 
that the dinner table was unbalanced. There were two people on one side of the table and one person on the other side of the table. And it was always like, kind of, ha, 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 that's a funny little story. And then all of a sudden, like this cold dread <laughs> came over me and I realized, oh my God, that's probably true. I exist because of this like weird OCD tick oh my, God. my dad. <laughs> wow, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for that. Wow, okay. So, what? <laughs> What was your plan? I mean, um, my, I, I bring up your dad because I wonder where, you know, comics came into um, the, the engineer, you know, who, who turned you on to it? Did you, was it an escape for you? Was it at home? What happened? How did it all come about? Well, you know, before, before the age of 14, I had nothing to do with comics because I looked down on them. But when I, when I finally got into them, I was right away, I was approaching them in an analytical way. I mean, you know, I never stopped being the engineer's son. Uh, you know, I was, I was only a year into it, just as a reader, when I, I saw some Jim Steranko Captain Americas or X-Men or something in, in uh, the playroom of a friend of mine, you know, two, two, doors, two doors down on Lexington's Dexter Road. And, um, uh, and I remember looking at it and thinking, as a kid, as a 15-year-old, it's like, wow, this art form has some potential. You saw right? it as an art form? I saw it as an art form that had potential, yeah, completely. I was just like... This we could do things with comics. I was always more interesting in what interested in what comics could do than in what they had done. Like even as a kid, that because I was a snooty little pretentious kid, and and it wasn't enough to just say I like the Wrecking Crew. They break things. That wasn't enough. You know, I, I it had to be about like the, I will reinvent the art form. You Stretching know, the imagination, yeah, so, using all the senses. Yeah, I remember so explaining to my dad I'd figure out a thing about whole page compositions because I'd been looking at Neil Adams' Dead Man and he had panels that ran into other panels and made bigger pictures if mm -hmm. you looked at them and it was like Salvador Dali and you know that's the kind of thing I was into. Um, and it was only later, actually, that I realized that pure storytelling was a, an interesting formal challenge mm -hmm. in and of itself. That was kind of the lesson of, of the first comic that I did with Kurt Busiek. He was writing, I was drawing, and we did this 60-page comic called The Battle of Lexington, mm -hmm. which is where a bunch of Marvel superheroes beat the crap of, out of each other and destroyed our high school. <laughs> and, um, but, but the thing was, as it went on, I started doing less and less of the, the, of the tricky formal experiments mm -hmm. and more and more of just straight storytelling because I realized, ooh, that's a really interesting formal challenge, mm -hmm. is to tell a story straight. And that's what I did with this. Mm -hmm. So there was, that became your plan. There, there was oh yes, no it was always the plan. <laughs> that, that was it? No, the plan never you varied. Yeah, no, by the age of 15, I had it all mapped out. Wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, there's an artist story for you. So I wanted to get, um, Oh, I wanted to ask, you edited Best American Comics. Yeah. Oh, my God. That's a very <laughs> difficult thing to do. Especially oh, you now have because no comics idea. are everywhere. Everywhere, everywhere. Tons of them. Yeah. Um, who do you admire, and, and it, what did you see in that experience? I mean, I know that you've said you, you learned a lot by, by doing that, but yeah. what did you learn, and who do you see, and who's coming up, and what to look for? There are so many different things. I mean, for me, I was trying to map the world, right? And so that meant finding all the different, the far points, the far, you know, like the, the here, here there be dragons, you know, like way off in the corner oceans and the, and the continents and, and like just get it all. So that's one of the reasons I was disappointed that for rights issues we couldn't include Hawkeye because it bothered me that there was no superhero comics anywhere in there. Mm -hmm. I wanted there to be superhero comics and Michael DeForge, you know, mm -hmm. and you know, uh, 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 Raina Telgemeier and the, the you know, um, uh, um, uh, you know, like the, the, the weird, obscure, you know, printed in an edition of 12, you know, things. I just, I wanted range. Mm -hmm. That was important to me. But, but the things, there were certain pieces that definitely pushed the envelope for me or, or that to me had a special resonance or that to me were, were like, like I kept them close to my chest. Mm -hmm. Sam Alden is, is an interesting, who's, who's seen Sam Alden's comics? There's, I think there's something about Alden, he's young, it's rough, but we feel like, oh, he's got it. He's just whatever it is, whatever that indescribable something is, he's just communing with the comics muse. He gets comics specifically as separate from drawing, draftsmanship, ruling panel borders, crafting sentences, all those individual skills, mm -hmm. he's got this other thing. 
this comicsiness that 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 that's so cool. <laughs> I, I don't know. Words fail. Do Words you guys really get fail. That? Comic yeah. Comicsiness, yeah. right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. He's got the comicsiness thing. Okay. Um, and uh, you know, I'm really enthusiastic right now about the all ages thing because I just I love what people like Raina Telgemeier are doing. Mm -hmm. Vera Brosgo, Kazuo mm -hmm. Kibuishi sitting right there with Amy. <laughs> Amy. I, I want to call you Amy Kim Ganter, but now you're Amy Kibuishi. Um, uh, that's that's an incredibly important sector right now because because this is the generation of creators that is ushering in a massive oncoming mm -hmm. army mm -hmm. of of new readers who will also be new artists. All the time. Yeah. And the web has changed everything. Is oh, the web. Oh, yeah. You see, look how long I went before mentioning the web. <laughs> anyone like anyone who saw me like like touring like ten years ago is like, oh my god, they're like looking at their watch. How far have we gone? without him mentioning the web. <laughs> Holy shit. Is that really him? Is that an imposter? Yeah, I mean like these, that's the thing. You can't see the whole, you, the, oh God. This is why. Have some water, have some water. <laughs> okay, this is why doing Best American Comics was so intense because we've gotten to a point, it's so different from when I started out because now you can't think about any part of comics and still see all the other parts of comics. It's like looking at the Pleiades, you know, that little part of the, mm -hmm. the night sky that you can only sort of see in your peripheral vision. You can't look right at them. It's, it's, if you're thinking about Raina Telgemeier, it's hard to also simultaneously be thinking about, uh, about Hawkeye and, and Michael DeForge. It's like they're, they're, they're on so many like removed corners, you know, mm -hmm. that, that it's just big. It's big. You can't see from, from horizon to horizon anymore, and that's the way it was always supposed to be. Mm -hmm. That's true of prose uh, books. That's, that's true of movies. That's true of television even now. Mm -hmm. um, it was always supposed to be like that. Comics was never supposed to be so small that you could fit it all in your field of vision. That's progress. It's good. It's biodiversity, and it's really healthy in the long run. Mm -hmm. And it's visual communication. But Absolutely, yeah. It's overwhelming. Yeah. A little bit. But um, it was really hard work. What? Just, okay, so do you buy comics or do people just send them to you? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. What do you spend yeah, that's your true. money on? People it's send me question. a lot of comics. Okay. That's God. really true. All right. But they're not always the ones I would have bought, so I also have to, <laughs> okay. have to buy comics. <laughs> Okay. As a matter, of, you know, like you know how often I've like looked at an incredible comic and and just thought, why didn't you send me a copy for endorsement, <laughs> jerk? Everybody else do it. I just want to ask, what do you do for yourself? What do you do when you're not sitting there for eleven or fourteen hours a day? When I'm not, this? when I'm not working. Yeah. Do you make? Do you make risotto or raise I, small dogs or anything like that? I become reacquainted with my beloved family, mm -hmm. who have to do without me while I'm while I'm working super long hours. So usually it's like, okay, we have this much time. Let's maximize maximize the quality time. Okay, let's do dinner quick so we can go out to see the movie so and do ice cream. Run through the Holocaust Museum. <laughs> run through the Holocaust Museum. <laughs> Well, I have, a, I have a kind of a work hard, play hard thing where I will work like ridiculous hours while I'm doing a project like this one, but then we'll spend a year or two years just traveling together. Like we went on a you know, year long tour after uh, my book making comics. Uh -huh. So my wife and family didn't see me much during the year and a half I spent on the book, but they saw me plenty. You know, they saw me 24 hours a day during the tour. Yeah. So that's wait, what we, that's the way we did it. Wait long enough and I'll be here a long time. Right, yeah, exactly. Got it. Um, okay, we're going to stop for questions, but I wanted to just ask, your next book is on visual communications and how we communicate with pictures, correct? Yeah, I'm, uh, the na if, I'm really excited about this next book. I think this next book could be really fantastic, uh, but the, the last book won't let me go. It's like, you know, it's going to be hard for me to think about anything else for a little while. But the next book is, as you say, about visual communication and specifically about the common denominators, the underlying principles that run across different disciplines. And I mean everything from information graphics to data visualizations to uh, educational animation, educational comics, you know, mm -hmm. nonfiction comics, and even forms of visual communication that we do naturally, like facial expressions and body language. And I believe that there are certain common denominators across those disciplines, but every one of those disciplines is trying to reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. You know, and I and and I think it would be really fascinating to kind of drill down and find out what are the core 
principles. Think of that. Figure, think of that landscape as a globe, right? I want to. I want to tunnel down to the core, and find out what you know. What what ideas are like bubbling up in all of these different fields? Basically, I've been describing it as a kind of elements of style for visual communication. Wow. Um, what does your office look like? It's very messy. I would say it's also like weird and cramped and tall so and narrow. It's a weird office. Hoardy, hoardish. Yeah, it's, it looks a little like a hoarder's office, Are you a but big, I'm, you, okay. I'm not really. No, and I'm not a collector either. I don't, and my total comics collection, considering how many years I've been in the business, is actually not that, not that impressive. You don't have any little figurines or anything? I have a couple of figurines. <laughs> <laughs> They're, they're in the window of my office, but they're cool. They're, Who are they? They're done. They're actually by um, Leslie. Leslie, what's her last name? Why did it fly out of my head? Leslie Gore. No, no, no. It's wonderful. <laughs> well, actually, there's some Futurama as well. This is Zoidberg. Oh, really? Yeah, and then there's like weird, one of a kind, like you know, wooden Norwegian sculptures and things. And, uh, yeah, but no, no, I'm not into that. Yeah, I don't. I don't really have, I have a lot of memorabilia or every Simpsons Futurama yeah. ever made. There's a, there's a particular culture surrounding those things that is like, I'm still a kid. You know, like I have, like I have all these figurines and all. I mean, there are people, like really thoughtful, wonderful people for whom that's, that's a very important thing to surround themselves mm -hmm. with childhood ephemera. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, I'm different than that, I guess. I'm not, I'm not that particular tribe of, of nerd. No, I'm a different a tribe of nerd. you're a with kids in college and a 500 page... I, I'm not completely a grown man. I do eat Captain Crunch or Frosted Flakes every morning right. for breakfast because that's a, it's a kind of affirmative ritual that I, I make comics all day for a living and, and so I can do that. You know? Because I love, I really love, I have the best job in the world. I you love do. doing it. Good. Then you never work a day in your life. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Yeah. Great. All right. Let's do some questions. Yes, please. Right here. So, Scott, you've spent the last, I'd say, 20 years mapping out the storytelling potential of comics in the digital age. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the decision that you made to tell your big story as a pretty much conventional graphic novel? Yeah. Well, you know, if I, if I had determined that this story would best be told as, an, you know, like an infinite canvas webcomic, I would have been at a real shitty crossroads because it would have been like, hey Scott, do you want to starve for the next five years? Go. Now, that, would have, that was before Patreon came along and who knows, I mean, we could have pulled it off. But for some reason, this is an old idea. This is something I had a long time ago and it just sort of formed itself as a book in my head. And in a way, by coming back to fiction, I also like this idea of coming back to the limitations of print to just kind of I don't know, just have one, one last fling at least. You know, my next project, that visual communication book, is probably going to start digitally. That's the plan. Uh, but one of the things, you know, I was doing with all the digital experiments was trying to discern what are the true limitations of print. In what ways does print restrict us? And by, by coming to understand that more fully, I felt I was better able to work within the limitations of print and really engage with print in a much more meaningful way. Um, and so it excited me to come back to it that way. It felt right for this one to be a book. But also, let's not forget, print is a technology. And when I talked about designing for the device, this is my, my latest crusade, is for people to get over this idea that they can just push a button and have something spread out to multiple platforms. That's, that's, a, that's a good, noble thing in responsive design and for website design and all, but it doesn't make sense for comics where the shape of the presentation is the presentation, right? Um, I, I, that's what I did here, right? I, you know, let's remember, I designed for the device. And it really only meant to be a book. Uh, there, there are ebook versions. There's a Kindle version that everybody hates so far. Um, <laughs> And uh, it, they exist because I want my publisher to recoup their investment. They've been very kind to me, and I'm not going to stand in the way of anything that will help them do that. But as far as I'm concerned, this is the only book. Mm -hmm. This is the only version. Um, this is what I designed. Also, the idea, there's a two-page spread in here, which is sort of a metaphysical moment where you see, you know, this, it's a visualization of death. It's, and that's spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> but it's a two-page blank spread. It's absolutely nothing but blank. 
And, and I keep wondering, like, in what ways will it enhance the, uh, the full metaphysical impact of this meditation on mortality to have a nice, helpful message saying, this page left intentionally blank <laughs> so that you don't think your Kindle is malfunctioning, you know? It's like, I wish them luck. It's like, <laughs> good luck with that, suckers. <laughs> So I wanted to ask you uh, about the high-level visual language that was expressed in this novel. Uh, it's about a sculptor. He sees everything in form, both you know, curvature, straight lines, and that appears in the structure of the comic itself. Yeah. And it really reminded me very strongly of Craig Thompson's Habibi, mm. where all the comic panels of themselves are events. The layout is often an arabesque, but it's this very strong visual theme present mm. both in the overall work but also in these little details. And I was wondering, uh, what kind of conscious process was that for you? Where there are so many sculpted elements, everything, in a sense, was sculpture. Even the, the calendar scene, which is amazing, mm -hmm. is in some sense of sculpture. You can yeah, absolutely. Existing in a museum in some uh, prop form. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was curious about that, that process. I think what you're describing, that idea of the structure, the narrative structure of it, right down to like panel structure choices and things like that, having a kind of semiotic charge to it. I think that's truer in Habibi than it was in, in my book, probably. And it's even truer still in a book like City of Glass, where really no decisions were made arbitrarily. In my case, I think a lot of the, the, a lot of the Easter eggs and a lot of the, the kind of braided, nestled, um, uh, symbolism and, 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 and kind of structural messages. A lot of that happened in panel. As far as, as far as the actual layout and pacing, most of that was done for just pragmatic reasons of like, I want this to go slower, I want this to go faster, uh, I want to draw the eye over here for story purposes. But mostly I didn't want us to really think too much about the meta world of the frame. The frames were, were pretty much just straight ahead storytelling choices. But then on the inside, and I think I hope some of you will notice if you if you read the book and reread it, it's really not a very slow read. It, it, you can read it in a couple of hours and you can kind of blast through it, despite the 500 pages. But then on rereading, I, I'm hoping that people will find out that there's a tremendous amount of structure going on in the visual storytelling, the choice of imagery, and especially the fact that the book is just stuffed with these rhyming couplets. There are, and I mean visually speaking there are the scenes rhyme with other scenes visually in ways that uh that i hope creates a kind of symbolic valence you know like that 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 individual metaphors visual metaphors are interesting because they 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 may have a specific purpose within the narrative but then there are these other these other energies around them that cause them to link up with other symbols other visual symbols or other aspects of those symbols in ways that just get your mind just like spinning off and think and, and imagining things. It's really hard to describe, but I think you'll see that there's a lot of stuff going on in the choice of imagery, uh, just maybe not quite so much in that superstructure of like panel shapes and things. No, 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 I'd never pick. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to be the, the one who left somebody out. When, when you compose originally, this, this, do you write the script in text all at once, or do you work with images along with the text, or is it primarily images? How, how do you, how do you build can I show you? Can I show you my working process? Okay. It's kind of cool. Yeah, we, I was thinking we didn't yeah. go back and ask how that's, all I thought of you was sitting in a chair for 13 hours. Yeah, well, there's, there's that. Yeah, let's, let's, let me show you this. This is, um, here's the, the, the notebook, first of all. This is the three ring notebook from high school. <laughs> With a, with a blue ballpoint pen drawing on it and the denim cover, that is actual denim, right? So that's where the idea was. These are the notes that I was taking when, when I was sitting in the passenger seat of our car while my wife drove us to all 50 states. Because it was great, I, just when I realized I have to do this book was just when we started a 50 state tour. So I couldn't draw anything. I couldn't do any real work on the book. All I could do was think about it and that turned out to be the best thing for it because it meant that I got to just sort of work out the story structure up here. So that's, those are the notes. And these are my layouts. This is a screenshot in Photoshop of 40 pages at a time. See, that's a row of 20 pages there and then 20 pages there. These are my rough layouts. 
And this is how I wrote the book. That is, when I say write, I mean that the first time that I would write any piece of dialogue, it was in the form of a word balloon in a rough approximation of that panel. Do you see? That's what it looked like. Okay, so these are pretty, they're kind of tight as, as layouts go. And then by doing them in these rows, it allowed me to think in terms of the flow of the story generally. So if I, you know, I could take out a panel as if you're taking out a word from a, a, an essay or something, and I can have these other panels stored up sort of on these white trays, and then I could reintroduce them when I needed to. And then the other stuff would just kind of reflow as it needed to, just like, just like when you're writing a, a document. Um, and then the whole thing just has that forward momentum. And, and, and I could concentrate on that forward momentum instead of getting too hung up on any individual page. Right? But once I was happy with those pages, then I would take those pages, isolate them, and they became kind of the base layer in Adobe Illustrator where I did all of my lettering. You can actually go on YouTube and find me demonstrating my lettering techniques in this, in this quiet, relaxing voice that I think may be giving people ASMR responses, <laughs> which, which I, I have, by the way. I definitely have ASMR. One other person has it as well in this audience, I've noticed. Um, <laughs> And uh, so, so I do my lettering, and then that creates this, these windows. My panels are basically windows. You know, we use that as a metaphor, but it's literally true here. They're the top layer of a Photoshop document, and they're opaque, right? The gutters are opaque. So that's the positive space, negative space. And then behind that are the word balloons, and behind the word balloons I draw, right? So if a line goes over a panel border, it doesn't matter because it's behind the window. And this is just a really wonderful way to work. And I have all of these different actions that uh, you know, I, I can use to very quickly do things <laughs> inside. <laughs> and the whole thing is drawn on a Cintiq tablet. And, and so with my left hand, I'm selecting you know, which brush I want to use. And just that means that I can spend the whole time just looking at the screen, looking at the work, and not thinking about my tools. So even though there's all this technology that goes into it, the whole purpose is that I can be thinking about art the whole time, not thinking about tools. And that's what I did for five years. Um, and so, so this is what it looks like when I would bring the layouts. Here's a subway station. This is the layout that I turn blue because, you know, blue, it's, it sort of recedes. And then I could introduce like perspective lines that I would create, perspective grids. And then I would just work from that in layer after layer after layer uh, until I had something that, that, that was more satisfyingly real and you know, convincing. And then you know, that was my panel. So that, that was my working process. But the stuff, the background stuff is, is wonderful. I mean, Thanks. it's well, just all, it's so, I, I don't know what else to say. But a, I, million, a million reference photos, you know? Like yeah. I just like, all, not just the photos the that I took. I took, yeah, tens of thousands of photos I took but then also I could go on the web and say subway stations, New York subway stations, and just get lots of, you know, what do those columns look like? What, what kind of trash cans are they? What kind of benches do they have? Mm -hmm. and, and I was just so grateful to all these strangers who had made their stuff freely available to help me to learn to draw everything. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to draw a story about New York that takes place in New York from Southern California. And yes, I've made a lot of trips. I went out to New York a lot, but still, if that would have been a horrible uh, disadvantage mm -hmm. if I didn't have the web. Wow. Yes. So I myself am about at the end of a four-year comics project, and I'm feeling a lot of weird, indescribable feelings. I would like to ask you, as someone who has been through finishing a multi-year comics project more than once, um, is it normal for it to be really hard to keep working on the pages? Because, you know, oh, God, it's, all right. it's almost done. I'm about to draw that one thing I've been planning for four years. And also, how has it changed from like, you know, finishing your first long project to finishing this long project? Well, one of the reasons I was able to finish this long project is I'd finished short ones before. Uh, I actually recommend when people are first embarking on comics, it really helps to finish things. And it really helps to finish short things. Because you can learn so much for each, each comic you do. Um, if you've embarked on something long, well, you've got to finish that. And yeah, it might take years. Um, hopefully you didn't make a vow to yourself to finish a 10,000-page space epic or anything like that. Sounds like you didn't. Some, some young artists do that. Maybe they shouldn't finish it. Um, 
because we all know what happens to artists who do. Um, so uh, uh, yeah, I think that if you if you feel that like that sort of disconnect as you're finally getting around to it, it's because you've worked too long in isolation. It's because you don't yet have the audience feedback. Um, a lot of people overcome that by just putting stuff online, and there are there are some really wonderful comics artists who've evolved in the last ten years or so, uh, who have evolved with their audience by their sides the whole time. Um, I worried at the beginning, when we were first doing this, like, like in the late 90s, early aughts, I was worried, does anyone say aughts? I still don't know what to call them. Um, I was worried that that generation that got constant validation from their audiences would be unable to grow. But I discovered pretty soon most do, most are able to do it, even with everybody telling them they're wonderful. Because it's the internet, so people also told them they were horrible. Um, and, uh, and, but that's a way to get around it, to not be in isolation. Um, but for me, working on this, well, I knew. I mean, I, I had enough experience that I could predict that certain things would fly, certain things weren't going to. I knew that there was sort of a baseline of appreciation that I would get, even if I got made fun of for this or that, as I have to some extent. Um, just like it's a stretch to authentically depict a character who's vastly more intelligent or enlightened than oneself, how did you approach um, coming up with hundreds and hundreds of sculptural designs from a, a genius or would-be genius sculptor? Well, I am a genius in one respect. <laughs> in one respect only when it comes to this book. I came up with a perfect loophole. This is a story about a failure. I could try as hard as I wanted to make his sculptures really awesome, but nothing that we actually see succeeds in the art market, <laughs> except kind of by, by a circuitous route by the end of the story. So, so like, I, I could make him as cool as I wanted, but the, the stuff that really succeeds is the stuff that he did before the story began that we never really saw. And then there's another thing that his art gallery friend thinks is really good, and we don't really see that either. So I don't have to be a genius, right? I can, I can just like try to make a whole lot of really cool sculptures, and then when they get rejected, you can think, uh, well, yeah, I guess I see what they mean. <laughs> right? And I don't have to, I don't have to like, downgrade them. I don't have to hold back. I can try really hard. You could work like for a hundred years to make the coolest, most amazing sculptures in the world, in the universe. You can study sculpture, you can like become brilliant at sculpture, and then design these things, and you can still have a guy walk in the room and go, hmm. And everybody will be like, yep, that's what happens. Guy comes in, goes, hmm, and it's all over, right? Because it happens. So I, I was lucky that way. I didn't have to be a genius to, to do it. Uh, if I can go back to understanding comics, panel transitions for me are the most resonant part of that book. Me too. It blew my mind. And I have a two-part question. Were you the first person to identify them? And has anybody identified new panel transitions that you've said, yeah, that's a new one? Yes. Um, uh, definitely to the second question, people have definitely challenged my, my uh, taxonomy of panel transitions, usually adding some, you know, like, aha, but what about this kind, and this kind, and this kind, or saying that it's impossible to isolate certain transitions, which I think is true. Um, I compare it to clouds, you know, like, how can you tell me where a cumulus cloud begins or ends? You can't. You can't. There's no way to tell the, exactly where, because you get close enough and you see the fuzzy edges and you realize, what, is this part of air a part of the cumulus cloud? And is this part of air not part of the cumulus cloud? It's impossible. Nothing can be described. Nothing can be defined. And you could really convincingly say this as, as it starts to rain on you. Um, but, <laughs> but, you know, I think, yes, they're absolutely super fuzzy. But I think it's useful because you can, you can look in the abstract at the dynamics between the different types of transitions and, and say, yeah, this, is, this happens. This cognitive effect seems to come out. But uh, others have definitely suggested, I think Neil Cohn has a bunch that he's added to the pile. Um, has Matt Madden suggested some? There are a bunch. 
Um, and and I just like I just sit back and just go, wee! I don't have to I don't have to referee this one, right? Because I I have vested interests in in my original scheme, and I know history will sort it out, and I'll still be the the dumbbell that came up with the first bunch, right? Because as near as I can tell, yeah, I was the first I was the first one to start that taxonomy. I don't recall any. I don't think Eisner ever tried to put them in, in groups. Now that doesn't mean that people hadn't talked about what happened between the panels. But um, I don't think anyone had ever tried to, like, you know, pen them, classify them. Um, but it's like Freud. You know, everybody, Freud was wrong about everything. But he's still the father of psychology, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I win at life, even if, everybody, even if everybody pretty much decides I was wrong about everything. It's like, he built the house. What can you do? <laughs> Yeah, even exactly, even if very good, yeah. Go ahead. Um, Oops, sorry. So, this is the last one. So you have pressure. Um, you um, mostly come from a different generation of comics, but web comics are a big thing now. Do you have anything yeah. you really like, or do you read them at all? I have been, I have learned through cool experience not to name my favorite web comics. Because there are a lot of web comics, and everybody else gets mad at me. <laughs> but, and I mean really mad. I mean like I was thrown in a vat of boiling piss multiple times, um, in in the great web comics war of the Jurassic era. I'm like these are <laughs> like this is so old. These old flame wars. Nobody even remembers them anymore. But um, I will tell you something. Just recently, Meredith Grand, I think in Octopus Pie, reminded us all of the power of white space, something that, like one of my little crusades, is that in a hundred years of printed comics, we, we would always vary the size and shape of panels, but we would almost never vary the distance between panels. It was always somewhere between, you know, a quarter of an inch and a third of an inch, like very little variation at all. You could look at an entire artist's career and never find any variation in the distance between panels. So in other words, there was amplitude modulation, but there was no frequency modulation. And isn't that interesting? And why? Because you don't want to waste paper because people get angry at you. But if you're online, you can do that. You can take two panels and say, hey, look, this happens, then this happens. Boom, boom. What would happen if we took this and moved it over here? Then it would be like, this happens, boom. And this happens, boom. And Meredith did that in Octopus Pie recently. Others have, Jason Turner and, and others have played with this. But it's, to me, it's like saying, wow, we've been using strings and woodwinds to really good effect all these years. We do not need these metal things that you can blow air through. We do not need these things you can hit. It's like, no, 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 just try it. Try this other half of the orchestra and you might find some really exciting new effects. It's so fundamental playing with the space between panels. We trade in spaces. These are temporal maps. And if you're doing it online, you don't have to waste paper, right? So you can start to space things out. Um, so yeah, but you see, that's just, that's 2001 Scott, like just briefly flying through like a bat <laughs> trapped in the, what, what's that doing here? Get him out of here. We're talking to 2015 Scott. I will come back to web comics, but I'm just really, really slow. And it just, it took me five years to do the book, but I, there's so much unfinished business um, and, and so many incredibly exciting possibilities uh, for comics in digital spaces. I mean, that's just one of them, things like frequency modulation. It's just, see, now you, you see that had no dramatic finish to it. <laughs> I think we need one more question so I can come up with something that sounds like a last answer. Very, the very tall arm in the back. Um, okay. Uh, through Understanding Comics, you deconstructed and broke down pretty much most everything you can think about for a comic. Um, do you feel like, in your new book and work since that, um, that you think about it more often and you're more hypercritical about what you're doing for it? No, you know what, I, I, I'm good at siloing off and compartmentalizing things. So like, while I was working on this, I put all of those tools aside, all those theoretical tools aside until I needed them. And I started really thinking about story structure. Especially trying to play out this, this feeling that I have that stories at their heart are often 
not about characters, but they're the, it's kind of the life cycle of a desire. And, and the stories become interesting when you interrogate the worth of that desire. You allow the character to ter interrogate the worth of that desire. You allow the audience to interrogate the worth of that desire, and you as the author interrogate it. You allow us to really find the sources of it and see the consequences of it and see it be transformed in interesting ways. Because look at all of your favorite stories. Most of them come to rest when the desire comes to rest, right? When whatever it is that had driven characters forward is either fulfilled, denied, or transformed, the story is usually over. And, uh, and it's usually the story begins when you see the gestation of that desire in some way, shape, or form. Or multiple desires, you know, in the case of, say, adventure stories where everybody wants to throw the, you know, ring in a volcano or whatever. Um, and, and, and so in this story, I had a character who wanted something so desperately uh, that the story was almost like a straight line. And I think that you'll find that if the story has an interesting shape, it's the way in which that line continues to draw itself beyond the edges of the paper, um, you know, out, out into the void. And, um, and it's the straightness and simplicity of it that I hope will come as a surprise. Um, so that's also kind of a trailing, no, it's not. deteriorating end. But I guess we're done, yeah. That's great. No, no, I love that. Um, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Into the Everybody. void. Thank you, Scott, for there. being here. Thank, Thank you. Everybody. Thanks, everybody. Um,